And you don't want to be in that position. You don't want to be sitting down and say, remember when, because the best years were behind you. You want to try to create a life where you're living in good times, maybe not the best, but they're still good, and the future looks bright. And you have to prepare and you have to make that happen by not doing wrong things in your life that are gonna have you suffer consequences. And things change and you gotta deal with that. And if you already have so much baggage on your back that's taken you down, how tough is it? How much more difficult is to deal with life's everyday curves that some of them are so unexpected? Hey everyone, welcome to another sit down with Michael Francis. Hope everybody is doing well. All is very good, very blessed on this end. As always, I give God all the praise, honor, and glory for that. And boy, do I mean it. And people, the way I say that is the way I mean it because if it wasn't for God having a different plan and a purpose for my life, I firmly believe I'd either be dead or in prison for the rest of my life. So I am very grateful to God for all the blessings through all the struggles and challenges that he's given me. And um, like I said in a uh, prior video, I was just so honored and privileged to uh, be able to address a number of men, several hundred over the past few weeks and uh, just talk about fellowship and what it is to be a man and just to be thankful for the blessings that we have in our life. And uh, it's just always great. And I've been doing that for the 25 years and it, it never gets old, people, it never gets old. So that's that. And what else do I have to announce? Nothing urgent other than I am going to be at Texas A&M, going to be spoken, speaking to all the student athletes uh, on August 5th, on August 9th. Nick Saban, coach, good friend. I'll be in Alabama speaking to uh, the football team gambling, relationships that they keep. We got to keep these young men straight. Got to do it, man. It's important. And then I, uh, I have a number of other events coming up and uh, that I'm excited about it. And of course, on September 9th, I'm going to be with Boom Boom Mancini in Ohio. Uh, we're doing a big fundraising event for Boom Boom's Foundation. And I love the guy. He's a very, you know, just a sincere guy. I love him. And then, of course, on September 23rd, I'm going to be in Atlantic City at Caesars World. Uh, we're going to be doing a big event there that night. I'll be the main speaker. And then, of course, September 28th, Champions Corner at the Beacon Theater in New York. Myself, Mike Tyson, Chaz Palminteri on stage. Uh, tickets are going on sale very soon. And uh, so we got a number of great things coming up. It's going to be great. What am I doing today? You know, earlier today, I had an opportunity to tape a show. It's called Club Metaverse. And the fella that hosts that show is a fellow by the name of Mark uh, Fernandez. We were having a good time. We had a great conversation. He aired it at some point, maybe aired already. I don't know. But he mentioned something that kind of struck a chord with me and made me start thinking a little bit, and I thought I would talk about it. You know, I like to talk about things that are relevant, that may be uh, not only entertaining, but give you something to think about it, you know? And uh, he talked about a Sopranos episode that was entitled, Remember When? And it was actually season six, episode five, 15. It aired back on uh, April 22nd in 2007. Of course, you can go online and, and watch it at any time. I do remember that a bit, and and I want to read a summary of it. I want to give you my own perspective because people, the words remember when have such significance. Let me, let me kind of tell you something. When I was in prison, I was in, um, I was in Terminal Island. I was in so many prisons, but it was Terminal Island, right? And during my time, when I was out on the yard, they always would lock me down. But when I was out on the yard, I like to do my time, be active. I played some softball. You know, I played a little handball when I could. I walked the track. You know, I did things to kind of make my time go by. And uh, a lot of the black guys, I became very friendly with. And we would play sports together. And there was a guy by the name of Pete Milano. I think I mentioned 
attention to him. He was kind of the boss, if you want to call it that, of L.A. He came out of Cleveland originally. Really nice guy. Him, a guy by the name of Sam Shurantino. Nice guy. He was married to Keely Smith. I'm kind of, uh, uh, you know, aging myself when I talk about her. Louis Prima, Keely Smith. You know, they were a, 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 a music act. Um, but nice people. But I didn't hang with them that much. You know, they were older than me at the time. And they had their kind of group of L.A. guys that would hang together. I was always courteous uh, to them, always respectful. But I didn't hang with them. And my uh, bunkmate at the time, my cellmate, was Salvatore Gambino, uh, Rosario Gambino. And he came out of Philadelphia. He was related to Carlo. And he was in there on a, uh, you know, a pretty big case. And uh, he got 45 years at the time. And, uh, and we were good friends, good friends. So one day I'm playing, I'm walking the track rather, and I'm walking with a couple of guys, and Pete sends for me. He was just going where he normally goes with a bunch of his guys, where he stayed, I forget where it was, near the gym, and uh, he sends for me. He says, you know, I'd really like to see Michael. So a guy comes and gets me, and I go see Pete, and I'm sitting with him, it's me and him, and he says to me, Michael, I gotta ask you a question. I said, why? So he says, well, you know, you hang around with a lot of the black guys, and I don't want to give the impression that he was prejudiced. I'm not saying that. It was just that that was the group, not all the time, but a bunch of guys that I hung with, you know. I says, hey, Pete, let me, let me explain something to you. I says, I'm in here because of an Italian guy. It was my partner that became an informant and that put the finger on me. I said, not a black guy, not anybody else. I says, and again, in all due respect, you do your time your way, I'll do my time my way. And we kind of ended it nicely, you know, it was fine. And we went on to spend probably another year together there. Well, everything was fine, no problem at all. But it got me to thinking, you know, to sit around and talk about things the way they were because you're in a situation now and it'll never be like that again. Living in the past, not trying to think about what's happening now and how you're going to better yourself in the future. Now, don't get me wrong. You know, one of the things that I love to do with my family, go on vacation, spend time together, create memories so that when we sit around at a family gathering, we could talk about the great times we had. But in the midst of that, we're still having great times. And our future, you know, God willing, is looking well. So we're not dwelling on the past, uh, you know, the glory years, so to speak, because they were, were glory years for some. We're reliving good times. We're still living in, you know, hopefully good times. And we're going to have good times. Again, I say God willing, because we never can predict the future. When Mark said this, remember when, it kind of stimulated something me, and I went back and looked at the episode, and I want to talk about that. So I'm going to, I'm going to read an accumul I mean, a summary of the episode now. I'm going to give you some of my thoughts on it. I want you to think about this. Just think about it. You know, one of the saddest things, when I go into prisons, and I see guys in there in their 50s or 60s, and I sit down and we have a talk, because I, I try to you know, I'm, I'm a person of faith and I try to instill, you know, faith in them. And uh, they sit down and they say, but Michael, look at me. I'm 55 years old. I don't have a family. I've done all this time in prison. It's like, where am I going? Look what I've done to my life. It's so sad. It's so sad because all those years that they've wasted in their lives. And you don't want to be in that position. You don't want to be sitting down and say, remember when, because the best years were behind you. You want to try to create a life where you're living in good times. Maybe not the best, but they're still good. And the future looks bright. And you have to prepare and you have to make that happen by not doing wrong things in your life that are going to have you suffer consequences. You know, I always say this, life is tough enough when everything is good, everything is going great. And then all of a sudden, boom, sickness, boom, accident, boom, pandemic. Who knew? And things change and you got to deal with that. And if you already have so much baggage on your back that's taken you down, how tough is it? How much more difficult is to deal with life's everyday curves that some of them are so unexpected. So this, this episode kind of reminds me of that, and I want to talk about it through the lens of The Sopranos. And, and I'll give you my perspective, and hopefully it stimulates some thoughts so that you're never in a position where your glory years were behind you, and you have nothing really to say about today and about tomorrow. That's what's important. The past is the past, but you want your, your best times or your good times to continue today and tomorrow. So, let's talk about it. Remember When. It was season six, episode 15. According to Tony Soprano, remember when is the lowest form of conversation. Listen to that. Now, this is coming from Tony Soprano. Why? Because his life is kind of unraveling. If you watch The Sopranos, it's unraveling. Think about it. What he's talking about is that constant need to dwell on the past, to live in the world of what was, 
instead of understanding that things change and you need to move forward sometimes. You don't want to be in a position where you're only living in the past. You know, things change in life. We got to move forward. We got to make the best of our surroundings today. We got to prepare for what they're going to look like tomorrow. You don't want to be dwelling only on the past. He's mostly just saying it to get Paulie, we know who Paulie is, to get Paulie's goat because all Paulie has anymore is remember when. Now listen to how sad this is. He doesn't have a wife, he doesn't have kids, he doesn't even have a girlfriend. He's got his ma, sure, but that's not exactly a legacy. The most he can point to is several decades of loyal service to the ma, and even that seems to be going down the drain the older he gets. How I can relate this to so many of the guys that I knew, so many of the guys that I knew. Uh, and when I think about it, it's sad to see what their fate was and what their destiny was. It's very, very sad, so I get this. Where once he was a tough guy, idolized by a young Tony Soprano, now he's just an irritant, hovering on, edge of the old, on the edge of old age. So he launches into stories about what was, and Tony finally needles him on it when he's had enough. Yet, of course, Tony's just as driven by what was as anybody else. Man, isn't that sad? When all somebody has to think about was the past. You know, I, I gotta say something that I'm a little bit of ashamed of and kind of embarrassing. My grandfather, my mother's father, he went to Italy. It was his life's long dream to go to Italy, right? And I was younger then. And for years afterwards, years, and he was older, all he ever talked about was Italy and his trip. And finally, I say, Grandpa, enough already. How many times are you going to say this? You know, and now I kind of feel bad about it because this was so big to him to visit his homeland, you know, the place where, you know, his, his ancestry came from. And he was just so proud. He was living in Italy in the past for the rest of his life. He told those stories until he passed away, you know, but now I get it. Now I get it. But, you know, he still had a life and he still had his kids around him and everything else. But I kind of relate to that a little bit. And I felt bad that I would needle him about it. But that's what Tony Soprano is doing now. He's kind of like had enough of the of the old stories, you know, because Paulie has nothing else to live on. That's it. One of the things that's not talked about it all that often in analysis of The Sopranos is just how much it's a mob series set in a world that increasingly has little use for the mob. And I think we see that as it goes along. We're losing respect for the mob in the Soprano series, without a doubt. Uncle Junior sets up the card game in the mental hospital where he's incarcerated. This is all in this episode. And while the players use buttons because they can't get their hands on anything of real value, the buttons may as well stand in for the show's general message of what it's worth to be a mobster in the year 2007. And I can tell you this, it's even less worth to be a mobster in the year 2020. Trust me, I always say the golden year of Mafia Cosa Nostra in this country, the 50s to the mid 80s. After that, it's gone downhill. I'm not talking about the guys, quality of men or whatever. It's just natural circumstance because the government has made it a target and they were very successful in bringing that mob down and destroying that life. Good or bad, whatever way you think of it, that's the truth. So it's even tougher being in that life in 2023. Tony Soprano may have built a lavish, wealthy life through organized crime, but he said in the pilots that the best years of the mafia were behind him, true to life. And the rest of the series has gone to painstaking lengths to bear this out. I'm gonna stop and take a glass of wine. And again, people, Please don't call me an alcoholic. I had a couple of people say that. Michael, you're drinking so much wine. I told you why I drink wine. Family thing, all right? Now take a sip. Okay. The deals Tony and his crew close have less and less money involved in them and seem to be clearing lower and lower profit margins. Now, people, okay, cold is boastful of what? When I was leaving the mob, my profit margins were not down. They were at an all-time high. You know, I left, I left when uh, we were doing great guns in the gas business, you know, bringing in a bunch of money. It's documented. I don't have to go into it. I'm not bragging about it. It's just the way it was. I left at a high point, but I knew it was time to go. That's the difference. Racketeering laws were destroying people. The Sentencing Reform Act, destroying, they were giving people bundles of time for basically financial crimes, some of them. Not all of them. I know, Michael, there's mur I know there's murder and all that stuff, but a lot of guys for financial crimes. The whole commission case was about bid rigging, basically. It wasn't about murders, about bid rigging. They got 100 years, 100 years. So think about that. I knew it was time to go. I understood that. 
So let's keep going. This is a way of life that's been squeezed out by a modernizing world that no longer has much need for neighborhood criminals. The mob once filled a niche. Now that niche is as likely to be filled by a Jamba Juice or something else. I'm gonna dispute that. I'm gonna tell you this right now. In our neighborhoods, you wouldn't have to put toothpaste behind glass with a lock on it. We wouldn't allow it. If people were demonizing and you know wreaking havoc on our people in our community, it would stop. So you would want us back there right now. I can tell you that right now. And I'm sorry, say what you want. But we would not allow that. There was no crime in our neighborhoods. If anybody was doing crime, it was us. We didn't do it in our neighborhoods. People say, oh, you know, John Gotti was a hero. In his neighborhood, he was. And so was I to a certain respect. People liked what we did in the neighborhood. My father was a hero in our neighborhood. And all the guys that control their neighborhoods, they were, because we kept crime out, okay? And we would be doing it right now. So Jamba Juice doesn't do that. <laughs> Okay, it's fitting then that this episode takes Tony and surrounds him with people past their prime. He travels down to Miami with Paulie, the better to stay ahead of a possible murder charge stemming from the very first guy Tony ever killed back a few episodes. The show keeps circling back to this idea of a mobster's first kill this season, and it's in keeping with the season's obsession with death. The road trip for the two is filled with reminders that things aren't what they used to be, the most noticeable being the death of an old hotel in Virginia that the two men remember as being a good old place to say. stay. Now it's a far more corporate affair, and they can't get steak sent up in the room after 11 p.m., just salads and wraps. Instead, they're invited to try out the at attached bar where they can have nachos. The world has turned and left them here, and neither man is all that well equipped to deal with it. People, you don't want to be living in the past. The world is constantly changing. You don't want to keep going back and saying, remember when. Now, I will say this. I remember when things, I think, in this country were a lot better than they are today. But I can't live in that. I can't dwell in that. I have to deal with what's going on now. And I'm telling you this right now. This world, this country is going a little bit crazy. It really is. And we have to have a voice about it if we disagree with it. Disagreements is okay. It's all right. Divis divisiveness to a degree is okay because it causes debate and exchanging of ideas. But it's reached a point where it's no good anymore. People are at each other's throats. If you have a different idea, Idea, you're being canceled, or in many cases now you're being prosecuted. That's what's happening. Don't close your mind to this. Don't say it's not happening. It is happening. It's 100% happening. And I'm telling you, keep this video if you don't believe me, because I hope I'm wrong. But in years to come, you're going to remember what I'm telling you now. When you give the government the power to break the law, to go after who they feel are lawbreakers, you're endangering society in general because they will use it whenever they can. They're doing it now. And they'll do it again, and you may be a victim of it. Get on the wrong side of people in power, and they can empower law enforcement to come after you. We're in trouble. We're no longer a democracy at that point. And it's happening now. People, it's happening now, okay? How did I get off on that? Because it's always in my head. It's important. I'm very on top of the news because I want to know what's happening. For me, myself, my wife, my kids, my friends, we've got to know what's happening, okay? But again, don't live in the past. Live in the present. And if you've got to do something about the present, do it. That's it. Okay, let's keep going. In Miami, Tony and Paulie meet up with Beansy, the man confined to a wheelchair after Richie April ran over him with a car all the way back in season two. Remember that? Even as Tony is finding Paulie's presence more and more grating, because Paulie only talks about the past, Paulie complains about Beansy making note of how the man has to piss in a bag. I'm sorry, that's what he says. Piss in a bag. Because he's in a wheelchair and he lost control of himself that way. Fittingly, Beanie, Beansy seems to be the only one able to gain some perspective about Paulie, telling Tony to cut him some slack because Tony is really the only person Tony, uh, Paulie has. Do you ever want to be, be the person that has nobody? One of the saddest stories ever. J. Paul Getty, one of the wealthiest men in the world. When he died, he had seven people at his funeral. Seven people because of the way he conducted his life. You don't ever want to be the person that only has one other person. You want to be the person that people want to be around. You want to create a life for yourself, people. This is sad. And yet Tony keeps circling back to the idea that Paulie told Johnny Sack about that time Ralph made the joke about his wife. Remember that episode? The one that almost touched off a mob war back in season four. The past of the show is looming over its present, threatening to block out whatever view 
we have of the action. And of course, the other storyline in this episode uh, centers on Junior Soprano, seen in a photo down in Miami as a virile younger man and is now stuck in a mental ward trying to go back to the man he was even as vital parts of that man, like the ability to understand the Italian slang his former compatriots tossed his way are slipping away. How sad when you need to see an old timer just really losing it. You know, I was around some of the most powerful people on the street in this country. You know, you name them. Carmine Persico, Fat Tony, uh, Chin, you know, all of these guys, even my father at one point, to see where they ended up. You know, when you get to a point when you think that you're the most powerful person in the world, something or somebody's gonna bring you down. To watch these guys that were so powerful, they had the power of life and death at their fingertips. They were wealthy, they had guys under them, everything. How did they die? How did John Gotti die? chained to a, a handcuff to a, a, a bed, you know, choking on his own blood and vomit. I mean, it's terrible. It's just horrible to think. You don't ever want to be in a position where you put a situation in your life that causes you to be like that, people. No good. Think about what's happening in your life now. You have time, make it better. I don't know anyone individually, but I'm telling you, make it better. It's time to act. Okay, what does all of this mean? To you know, Junior Soprano losing it, Tony talking about remember when, what does this all mean? The most obvious answer is also likely the correct one here. The Sopranos has always been a series very interested in the way that its mobsters are obsessed with the world that came before and how they missed out on the good times. And this is one of the most prominent expressions of that theme. People, let me tell you, some of us online, we could be accused of that. We're telling stories about our past. We're living in the past in some way but we're doing it to entertain you, I think. I don't live in that life anymore. When I tell a story, I tell it from my perspective, from my experience, if it's about me, about others that I might have known. We're basically entertaining you, and as you can see, trying to move away from all the mob stories. There are guys online, hey, they're entertaining you with their stories, I don't have to give you their names, you know that, you're interested in it, the mob genre is still fairly hot, great. But we don't want to be living in that past. And it seems that, you know, the, the whole theme of The Sopranos is showing you that, that it's a dying breed, it's a dying life, but yet some of them are still clinging to it. I also think there's a bit of meta-critique of both the show and its fans going on in Terrence Winter's script. He's the writer. After all, the final seasons of most shows turn into an opportunity for the series to revisit many of its greatest hits. And even if The Sopranos wasn't exactly doing that at this point, it was certainly inviting its audience to remember all of the finest moments in the series, on and on. The irony left in, unstated in this episode is that Tony Soprano is the one who attacks Paulie for telling Remember When stories when he's the man most dominated by visions of a past he can never hope to live up to. Think about it. I don't want to, you know, go through the whole series again, but think about Tony's decline during that time. The episode gives him, Paulie and Beansy, as two possible futures, two men he could age into if he's lucky enough to live that long. Where Paulie was once the man he wanted to be when he grew up, Tony now might view growing into that man as something akin to a nightmare. Tony don't want to ever be Paulie, but he's leading himself in that direction. Yet his actual kin, the man he might actually become someday, is held up in this episode as sort of a funhouse mirror version of Tony, a person who's now a cautionary tale of old age and dementia. That's Uncle Junior. He's a walking, talking, remember when. Someone whose stories and jokes are easily forgotten, whose potency is replaced by buttons. I want to reveal something, people. When my dad came home, came out of prison after being in there so long, I have to say I was a little disappointed. Shame on me. I expected my father to come out and want to conquer the world and be back on top in the Colombo family again. And it was never going to be. It was a little disappointing to me, and it was very unfair of me to think of my dad in that way. He was getting older. He still had a bunch of parole on his back. He wasn't the guy that he was before he went in. He just wasn't. And I always felt a little disappointed by that. And this is not on him. This is me. This is me. I want you to, I'm not taking anything away from my dad, but that's how I saw it. I thought we were going to come out, he and I together, and it was going to be all different than the way it was. And it wasn't. And it was disappointing. But again, I don't hold him accountable for that. These were my thoughts, my understanding, my hopes, I would say just never materialized. It's easy to say, this is, we're gonna wrap it up. The Sopranos is about how people cannot change. In fact, I've probably said it 500 times since starting this series. This is what the author is saying. For all the ways the show is about people who are unwilling to change and face their own moral failings, 
It's also about how the world doesn't stand still, how society keeps changing even if you insist it's standing still. You wake up one day and the place you thought you lived in is no longer what it was or the hotel you wanted to stay in is long gone. It's easy to get washed along in nostalgia to end up overshadowed by the past because the past is a perfect country, a place we've made better in our heads through selective amnesia. To live and grow and change in the present requires active work and sacrifice. To live and grow and change in the present requires active work and sacrifice. Listen to that. Better than to simply live in a half-remembered version of what was and scoff as the world around you stops reflecting what you know to be true. People, I'm gonna end it with this. I talk to people all the time, people that are disgusted with what's going on in this world today. Gender-affirming surgery, stuff that's coming over the borders, the change in mentality, the change in morality. People are saying it never was like this in the past. Okay, but the past is gone. What are you gonna do about it now? What are you gonna do to change the present and hopefully preserve the future so that some of the morality and some of the things that we lived by in the past that made this country the greatest country in the world, what are we gonna do about it to effectuate change or to keep the status quo in a way? because the time is now. So don't be saying, remember when things were the way they were without doing anything about it now. You're living in the present, not in the past. Yeah, good to say remember when. Let's effectuate change so that remember when becomes right now. That's it, that's all I have to say. I know I get emotional through all these things, people, and I just, but anyway, how do I always leave you? Same way, never gonna change. Be safe, and man, I can't emphasize that enough, be safe. Be healthy, gotta take care of yourself, and as always, God bless all of you. I really mean that from the bottom of my heart, I really do, because I wanna see everybody blessed. And yes, I'll see you next time, take care.